Wednesday afternoon. I'm Anna Palmer, Senior Washington Correspondent and Editorial Director of Women Rule. Tonight, everyone is turning their attention to the one and only VP debate between Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris of California. Today, I'm hosting a virtual roundtable to discuss how tonight's debate could play out differently than the matchup between President Trump and Joe Biden and how Senator Harris has prepared for tonight. This roundtable kicks off Powering Forward, a series of virtual conversations intended to bring the women rural community together as we continue to power through a year that has changed American life and how women live, work, and lead from Washington to corporate America and in their own communities and households. Joining me today for this afternoon's roundtable is Maya Harris, Kamala's sister and one of her closest political advisors, Christine Pelosi, a member of the Democratic National Committee, and Jennifer Palmieri, former White House Communications Chief for President Obama and top advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. You can follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag rule with us. And I will also try to get to a few audience questions before we end this roundtable. Now, uh, before we get started, we have a special video. We are going to show a shortened video with Elizabeth Ralph, who writes the weekly Women Rule podcast as part of her video series, The Backstory on Women and Debating. All right, we're gonna watch it and then come back on the other side. There have been so many unprecedented curveballs in this election, it can be hard to keep up. But one thing remains constant. You know why people don't like her? Nobody likes her. I did not mention his name. Your you, well, I'm here. He's okay, not. Well, and Kamala Harris is up against the long-standing sexist scrutiny that women in politics face, which got us thinking. How do the obstacles that women face as politicians translate to the debate stage? Kamala Harris and Mike Pence are about to face each other in the first vice presidential debate, and their different debating styles have political junkies buzzing. The women's debate performance tends to be scrutinized at a higher level. They can't be too feminine or they risk not being taken seriously. If they're too assertive, they're dubbed unlikable. Just look at what happened in 2008 when Sarah Palin's sex appeal and Hillary Clinton's pantsuits saturated pop culture. A contrast made clear in this SNL skit. Please stop photoshopping my head on sex bikini pictures <laughs> and stop saying I have cankles <laughs> and of course there is one of the oldest sexist tropes about women in politics they are too emotional I'd ask for forgiveness anytime any of you get mad at me uh, I can be blunt I will ask for forgiveness I know that sometimes um, I get really worked up <laughs> and sometimes I get a little hot I don't really mean to. All right. Well, you can see the full video by going to politico.com, but let's get started with this conversation. Maya, Jen, Christine, thank you so much for joining me today. Jen, I want to start with you teeing off of that video, uh, which really showed more broadly the different ways sexism has pervaded politics for a long time now. Can you set the table for this conversation? What's the environment like now for a woman running, and in particular for Senator Harris as Joe Biden's vice presidential candidate? So I think that the environment is slightly better than it was in 2016. I mean, the way I look at it in 2016 was Hillary Clinton was often, I mean, you all, you know, cataloged some of the, the moments from 2008 and 16. Um, in that video, um, she was often held, um, she was often subjected to um, attacks, political attacks, and coverage that was rooted in gender bias. Sometimes it's out and out um, sexism and misogyny. And I think that sort of writ large, the political ecosystem did not recognize it as such. We thought there's something wrong with her. And after she lost, which was, um, you know, from my perspective, devastating, but very much eye-opening experience, I think we just look at it differently now. So I remember on the very first day that Elizabeth Warren got into the race in January of 2019, um, there was a story that talked about how she's going to deal with likability. And I was disappointed to see that story, but there was a bunch of pushback. Um, right, right away about saying that we're not going to let this happen this time. We understand what likability means. It means uh, we don't sort of recognize a woman in this in this role. So I feel that 
all of the, you know, it's just harder for women candidates. It still is. I mean, I think that one of the reasons why women, um, the presidency is, ex is the exception here as opposed to the rule, one of the reasons why women candidates do do so well is because one, by the time they run and once they've gotten through a very tough primary, they're really good candidates, right? They're really good at this. So it takes, um, women still have a harder um, row to hoe, but I do think that uh, the public, the political ecosystem being more aware of gendered coverage and, and, and recognizing bias and things like electability, that that I choose to hold on to as a little bit as, as improvement. And I think Kamala Harris, as someone who's, um, you know, sort of a general political generation behind Hillary Clinton. Kamala Harris has her whole life had to be very clear about who she is. So, you know, a, a a woman of color, a woman of mixed race. She's had to really define herself, and that is why I think it is hard for people to throw her off her game in a way that other women candidates sometimes um, get uh, pigeonholed. Um, so. She has the benefit of a of operating in a system that is a little more aware. It's not it's not as if she's not subjected to the same kind of biases. We just some parts of us understand it now. But also, I think she's just very skilled at defining herself and not letting herself get pigeonholed because she's had to do it her whole life. Yeah, to your point, I mean, I think down ballot, we've seen such a shift yeah. uh, in terms of women embracing different aspects of themselves mm -hmm. or their femininity in a way that I think before we kind of wanted to put in a box if you were running because you wanted to you know, wear the shoulder pads and the pearls and kind of play a part. I think there's certainly from 2008 been a massive shift. Maya, I want to go to you next. Uh, you are one of the people who knows Kamala best. Can you take us behind the scenes? This is probably her biggest moment so far besides her first speech when she uh, accepted being Joe Biden's vice presidential candidate. How is she preparing for this big debate? Oh, I think Maya, actually, you're muted. If you can unmute it, unfortunately. There. Sorry. Yes, there. There she is. Maya. All right, so we'll take it back from the top. Is that take it back from the top. No, I was just saying that, you know, um, she's excited. She's actually excited about it. She's ready to get up on the stage um, that, you know, for her, you know, for all of us, campaigns are about choices and this debate's a chance to help people see their choices. And in this election, the choices couldn't be more clear. The differences couldn't be more stark. Um, I think, you know, it's also for her and how she sees this as is as an opportunity um, for her to share her and Joe's vision and really, you know, to, to show what what they're for, not just what they're not and not just who they're running against, because I think they really, you know, for her want to be able to speak to what people are really concerned about, their health, their pre-existing conditions, you know, getting back to work, getting back to school. And I mean, what I can say as her sister is that this is personal for her. Um, it is a, a big opportunity in terms of, you know, another big moment on the stage to be able to speak to the to, to the American people. But it's also personal for her. I mean, she talks a lot about the kind of suffering and the grieving and what we're witnessing, you know, it, the impact on real people in this moment. And you have to remember that Kamala is someone who has spent her entire life in public service, like literally spent her entire life fighting for people, fighting for truth. Her focus has always been on you know, bringing voice or, or fighting for people who are too often like not seen and not heard. And so it's, it is personal for her, I think, to to be on that stage and to speak to the American people, but also represent the issues that they care about. And, and the, you know, the last thing I'd say is that she truly believes that Joe is the right leader for this moment. And so she's excited to get up there and really speak to why she believes he is the right person for this moment is actually going to, you know, move us in the direction that we need to go as a country. So we're, you know, getting ready and 
I'm excited. I'm ready. See, she got my camel shirt on. Are you I'm ready? For it? I like it. <laughs> are you in? I, I Maya, follow up one second. I I is, Maya, is, is Maya in Salt Lake? Are you are you there? I you am in Salt, Salt Lake. Lake. I am in Salt Lake. I, I got here, um, I guess, yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, so, yes, I am on the ground. I, I want to follow, just tee up one thing. I mean, I do think, obviously, the Democrats had a lot of debates <laughs> this cycle. So mm -hmm. this probably isn't the first time a lot of Democrats, anyway, have seen her on the debate stage. But this is a different opponent, right? You're not just debating people within your party where you have a lot of the same kind of ideas. Is she approaching this differently at, at all, given the fact that it, she is going to be going up against uh, the vice president? Well, you know, um, I will not tell her secrets. Um, <laughs> I, I can tell you she's ready and I'm going to be, you know, definitely interested to hear what my good friend Jen would have to say about that and Christine in terms of what, you know, they think she should, you know, be thinking about. But but let me speak to something that you did did specifically touch on, which is how this is different than the primary and how this is also different than the debate we just saw last Tuesday, right? Which is that... Um, you know, one, I ex expect this is going to be an actual robust debate. I mean, Trump, what, you know, not Trump, Pence is a good debater. We saw that in 2016. Jen and I, you know, witnessed that up close. Um, the difference between 2016 and now is that back then Trump and Pence were an experiment and now they actually have a record that they have to run on and have to defend. But the other thing in terms of, you know, a difference is that he that, that Pence is a different kind of debater than Trump. So I don't expect that we're going to see tonight what we saw, you know, um, last Tuesday. I think Pence will be more reasonable sounding. Um, but I think and I so I think that's a obviously a kind of different context or different environment, um, you know, for having a debate. But I also think it's important not to be confused that his delivery could be different, but his substance is the same. And we saw that at the Republican National Convention. And so I think that, you know, it's going to be really important not only for Kamala to be able to share their vision and, you know, at times hold um, him accountable for his record, but also for the moderator and the media to hold him accountable because he can say whatever he's saying with confidence and with a smile, but it doesn't make what he's saying any more true or any more good for the American people because his demeanor may be different. Christine, I want to bring you into the conversation. Uh, you've known Kamala for a really long time, from her days back as a prosecutor in California. How do you think her legal background plays into her debate style? Uh, and do we do you expect her to to take advantage of that tonight? Absolutely. Well, it's great to be here um, with you, powerful women. And what a historic occasion tonight. The first time a woman of color will be in a vice presidential debate. So let's just take a moment and recognize that we are going to be witnessing history. And I think that's really important because it speaks to the different audiences uh, within the one big meta audience. Um, first of all, because it's the first time that we've seen someone who looks like Kamala on this stage, this large, a lot of a lot of people, particularly I think women of color, particularly African-American women and Asian women are going to look and see themselves. And that's going to be very po powerful. And she'll be speaking to them. Second of all, you saw a gender gap last week between the way the women saw uh, Biden's performance and the way the men did. A lot of the men pulled right afterwards, thought Biden should have been tougher on Trump. And the women said, no, he, he played it just about right. Um, he talked to us and, and not to his opponent. And so third, we, when we look at, at Kamala, I remember a trial that Kamala had very early on in her career as a line district attorney before she became the elected district attorney. And uh, she had recently come to the office. She had come with a big reputation. And she was up against a guy who was such a famous defense attorney. They even had a movie made about him. He was legendary. And everybody packed the courtroom just expecting, oh, she's really going to lose. And they were, you know, Others of us were like, no, she's going to be great. Well, Kamala put on a clinic. She just put on a clinic. She won every single charge. She was really, really well prepared. And as my mom, Nancy Pelosi, always says, <laughs> proper preparation prevents poor performance. And so I know that Kamala will be prepared to, number one, be that different kind of leader uh, that we haven't seen before. Uh, number two, that she will be... Um, 
as Joe Biden was last week, speaking to us, the American people, and not trying to win every single point against Pence so much as to prosecute his record as a whole. And number three, I think that just as I saw her in the courtroom, she's going to go through the evidence very methodically and very carefully uh, without passion or prejudice. That doesn't mean she won't have care and concern. It means she's trying to make an argument that any reasonable person um, would accept and see that it's, uh, it's unacceptable for this record to deserve a second term. Uh, Jen, I want to go to you next. I mean, the backdrop of all of this, it's a very historic night, uh, as Christine points out, but it's also historic. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, the president himself has COVID-19 uh, and is going through that process. The Biden campaign has pulled down all of its negative ads. How do you advise, uh, you know, a, a candidate like Kamala to approach this? Because you want to be hard, you want to be direct, you want to prosecute your case. But I, I assume you also don't want to come off as unfeeling and uncaring to to what the whole country is going through. Sure, and and particularly because she's a woman, you know, as uh, Hillary uh, uh, recommended to Senator Harris, you know, you want to be aggressive, but not too aggressive. This is the kind of uh, advice that we would get all the time, uh, sort of conflicting advice. But when it comes from Hillary Clinton to Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris knows what that means. And I actually think that Joe Biden has set a good example for um, how to deal with this. It's, you know, show empathy, right? Obviously, we all hope the president gets better, really concerned. I mean, I'm honestly like, I haven't heard, of, I haven't heard a word about how the first lady is doing or hope Hicks or um, uh, so just hope that everyone is doing well, but hold them accountable for how they have mismanaged the, the pandemic. And I think that you can do, um, you can do both of those things um, that she can do both of those things simultaneously. And the pandemic is, it's not that, you know, it's not as if Donald Trump um, had a heart attack or came down with pneumonia, for example. Um, he uh it this is uh this is not an individual case this the the pandemic affects every single american and it is it is so rooted in the presidential campaign she has to make the argument that they have been um you know woefully lacking in how they um they have handled it and uh but i th i think that i think she can do she can do both of those things my my father as a as just sort of a, a good anecdote he's 89 years old he is a former republican um you know he you know he voted for hillary and he's not he's not like he's he's, he's a never trump republican um and he said to me six months ago he's like you know I really hope Kamala Harris is the running mate because I would love to see her go up against Mike Pence. So <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. I was like, all right, it's your dad. So tonight, John Palmieri gets his wish. Um, but, you know, she is really, she's really effective in this. She's very, I mean, I know, so is, it is true that Pence not to raise expectations for her unduly. Pence is is good too. I mean, he's, he, is effect, he can be very effective, but um, I think she'll manage this. She'll manage this well. And she'll be able to deliver message in a way that Biden couldn't do because he had a heckler at his side. And that's a big opportunity for the Biden-Harris ticket. Yeah, I, I want to kind of touch on what Jen was just saying at the front end of that, right? You know, what the Hillary Clinton advice, <laughs> no, don't get too, don't, don't get too angry. I mean, how concerned or how prepared does the senator have to be, you know, to not have the trope of the angry black woman come out if she is aggressive towards uh, the vice president that is aggressive towards wanting to respond pretty directly to things that she might think are are false or claims that he's saying that that aren't aren't true. Well, I mean, I of course agree with Jen that I think um, having seen her literally now, I mean, for you know dozens <laughs> of years, um, you know, move in different spaces at different times. Um, I am confident that she can calibrate. Um, you know, the, and, and, and walk the balance of what's needed for a moment like this. But I also, you know, want to underscore and agree with Jen on the point being that, you know, this is an important moment, but it's an important moment that's defined by Trump and Pence's <laughs> abject failure and mismanagement of the pandemic. It's not like a separate moment. And I think that that's really important, you know, to keep front and center. Um, and I think that, you know, she'll be able to, as Jen said, um, you know, walk that walk that balance of, because I, because it's genuine. I mean, she and and Joe are genuinely 
um, wish the best for the president and the first lady and other people who have now found themselves infected with this virus um, and, and hope that it becomes a moment for everyone in, in, and most especially his own supporters to be able to see how serious this is and how serious people should be taking it um, and and to, to model that, you know, we should be wearing masks and we should be social distancing and that, you know, that they actually have a, a plan for how to carry us forward, you know, through this moment. And I think that um, it, it, that to the extent that she has genuine compassion and concern, not only for um, the most recent sort of round of people who have found themselves in, infected with the virus, but you know, across the board for the, you know, more than 7 million people who are infected and, you know, more than 200,000, you know, people who've died, their families. Um, and so I think that will come through genuinely because that's who she is. Um, and then I, I think she will be pointed in being clear about the stakes and, um, and being clear about this defining moment in our country, um, you know, in terms of, the pan, not just the pandemic, but the leadership and the future and what we need, you know, going forward into the future. And I, can, I add, can I add one thing to that? Of course, sure. I think this is my point too, that um, Kamala Harris has been the public eye for a long time. And so yeah. she, for a lot, you know, she's had to temper, she's had to thread that needle for decades so that she doesn't come across as the angry black woman. I just, I just think she is, you know, um, uh, Pence will be effective at delivering message. He is effective at doing that. Um, Kamala Harris is going to have to thread this needle that women often do. Um, but I think, you know, particularly because she is a woman of color, because she's a mixed race, she's had so much experience in doing that. Um, she's really effective at it. And, you know, like people are good at anything, she makes it look effortless. I mean, it's too bad that she has to do that, but she's quite capable of it. I want to go to an audience question now because we are quickly running out of time. Um, Christina, I'm going to let you take this. And then if Maya or Jen want to jump in, please feel free. The question is, what can we do, if anything, to expose or even prevent sexism from harming Senator Harris's candidacy, given the pervasive double standard facing female candidates? Obviously, something that's kind of been we've been talking about throughout this. But, Christine, any, any thoughts on that? Sure. I think, first of all, it doesn't matter what Kamala says. She can stand there and say the rosary for an hour and they'll still call her an angry black woman um, because that's what they do. So let's understand three things. Number one, no matter what she says, she will be uh, attacked as being far, far left very, very angry, and the one who's secretly in control of Joe Biden, because those are the three tropes that they will use no matter what happens. So what we can do is, number one, respond in real time by having her back and doing a fact check, and number two, calling out those tropes the minute we see them with a rapid response and saying, no, that's actually not what happens, and you would not say that about a man. And if you wouldn't say it about a man, you shouldn't say it about a woman. And the second thing is, remember, Mike Pence has two audiences as well. He has the American people who he wants them to see him as the future president, but his real audience is the audience of one Donald Trump. And I think he's going to be under enormous pressure to personally attack Kamala. And that is where Kamala knows that's coming. She'll be very strong about it. And what we can do again to have her back is say, aha, see, he's saying that because Trump wants him to. He's saying that because Trump is afraid of women. He's afraid of strong women. And he claims to love law and order, but not when it's directed at him. Anna, can I just add one thing? Um, it, and part of this, I think, I mean, this is, you know, I'm here as her sister, not just somebody who's been involved in political campaigns, um, you know, my whole life, um, it, to inject some of the upside and the positive in that, you know, you know as a woman, um, this is really exciting, right, to me. Mm -hmm. I think we know there are challenges, uh, you know, Jen and I lived it up you know, close and personal with with Hillary, but it is exciting. You know, I mean, I for me personally, I feel like how many people get to work for the first, you know, woman to be a major party nominee and to win the popular vote by millions of votes, um, and then be related to someone who, <laughs> you know, is runs for president the next year and is on the vice pre the next cycle and is on the vice presidential ticket. It's exciting, and then. 
you know, just to the point about the people out there, you know, as a sister, I am so not just proud of her, but I have actually been moved by the support that we've experienced in this and the enthusiasm that we have experienced in this and the people who've been coming out who've never you know really been involved in in the process before i think it was jen or maybe it was christine who talked about people who see themselves in her and so mm-hmm. i you know i also just think there is there is a groundswell actually also though of people who are really seeing this as an opportunity and seeing this as a, a time to, you know, move forward and seeing themselves in her. And I think that for her, for me, at the end of the day, it isn't so much that it's about her, um, e- you know, as it is about what's what's at stake and that even for those people who are inspired, um, it is a hope for, you know, an administration, a government that's going to, you know, see that they can see themselves in and that will see them and their hopes and their dreams and their fears um, which, of course, I know they'll find that in Joe and Kamala, but I kind of just wanted to inject that in, too, because I think um, there there is a lot of energy and, and a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of people wanting to be self-reflective about how they're approaching this campaign and this candidacy, particularly in light of all the things that you about at the beginning that we learned, um, you know, in in the cycle and and so i i you know as i know you said we're going to be winding up kind of wanted to inject a little bit of, of that excitement um because i feel that out there and we're seeing it out there and um and i think that that is going to carry the day oh, i appreciate that very much jen i'm just going to end with you because i think you've been in the advisor uh role a lot you've been at the last 20 days kind of sprint to the election we've talked about the pandemic this is going to be a different debate they're going to have plexiglass how do you think the campaign can best use Kamala in the closing days to make that closing argument, to maybe get that enthusiasm, the, the folks that Maya was talking about that, you know, see themselves in her, that maybe haven't seen, you know, themselves in other candidates before? Yeah, well, the first, I mean, the first opportunity is tonight because it is so hard for the Democratic ticket to break through with news because, of the, you know, because Trump takes up so much oxygen. And um, this this is just the most important moment she has to um, to just to be able to say this is what we will do in a Biden Harris administration, mm-hmm. and just you know by her own presence, um, it, as, as Maya said, be a role model, show what's possible, celebrate that moment of history in America, and then I think as she and Biden have done in recent days, be on the road as much as you can, and to be um, have her be publicly seen as much as you safely can do. Um, they will still not break through as much as Trump does. Um, I mean, he's just sitting, you know, I'm at the, I'm at the Willard right now. So I'm gesturing across the street to the white house. He's just sitting in the white house and he's monopolizing all of the coverage. So being out with people and obviously it's in our Harris is so great with people too. That just, it, in these States, it just makes a really big difference. Um, and the, you know, to use her in a way that's exciting people um, and being on the ground in states, even if it's a small, even if it's with a small number of people, you're going to see that that's going to that's going to be a great contrast with what they see on the on the Trump side. All right. Well, unfortunately, ladies, we are all out of time. Maya, Jen, Christine, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our virtual vice presidential roundtable. The first conversation in our Women Rule Powering Forward series. Uh, We will be back on Wednesday, November 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern here on Politico.com for a post-election conversation. Uh, It's going to be certainly an interesting next couple of weeks and the outcome may be known at that time, maybe not. Either way, we are going to have a conversation about how women did in this election, where things stand going forward. If you don't already subscribe to the Women Rule newsletter, which publishes every Friday, please visit politico.com slash women rule and sign up. I want to thank you again. Stay healthy, stay safe, and have a great Wednesday.